Welcome to the official Tom Steyer for President 2020 podcast, where I am joined today and only today by Azure Scapegoat, the Swedish communist. Welcome, Azure. Thank you for having me on, Peter. It's an honor. Yeah, I mean, we would like to remind everyone that you should do your part in keeping the Steyer momentum going and obviously get all your friends and billionaires to donate to his campaign. Make sure that uh, you're wearing fancy, upbeat, hilarious ties to work <laughs> to spread positive energy, be the change you want to see in the world yeah. and do a lot of barbecues with your coworkers. That just seems like such an important part that we're missing these days, you know? This is how Steyer can still win. Yeah, obviously. He's not he's not going to win. Okay, so Steyer is obviously not going to win like state delegates or popular vote stuff mm. or um I guess like likability polls, any minority voters, but you know what? I think he has a shot at winning the pure imagination capturing factor <laughs> that people just don't talk about in elections enough, I think. Is Tom Steyer the new Marianne Williamson? He's like a fun Michael Scott. <laughs> he's like, yeah, yeah, I guess he, he sort of is. I'm sure I'm not the first person to make that uh, observation, but <laughs> world's best boss. Yeah. Yeah. He does have that fun boss energy that, uh, that guy that's going to take, that's going to not take you on a course at work against your will, but that's going to ask what kind of course you'd like to do and what kind of like team building exercises <laughs> you'd like to engaging, uh, engage in with your colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> That yeah, I think that's an apt uh, comparison. Uh, we're gonna, if you didn't um, realize, we're gonna be talking about the Democratic primaries today. Full disclosure: this is taped on the day of the New Hampshire primaries. So this is, um, I don't know when this is this will go out. So obviously we don't have the numbers from New Hampshire. Uh, it's actually today that they're voting. Like I said, so yeah. we don't technically have the numbers for the Iowa caucus either. But that was ages ago. <laughs> but, uh, you know, yeah, that's a whole thing. The Democratic Party really is just dead set on destroying Bernie Sanders, it seems like. Either that or they are just hilariously incompetent in everything they do. I don't know what's worse. Like, I don't yeah. know if it's worse that they, if they are doing some elaborate cover-up, which I think they are, or if they are just hilariously incompetent, because to me, those are just both the same trajectory towards defeat in November. So... Uh, I think we should give some context to people who might not know what's going on or what primaries even are. Right. In America, they have a nominating procedure where the two major parties nominate their presidential candidates. Uh, and the states that participate in the primaries, all states do, all 50 states, have different ways of doing them. You probably, if you've followed the news at all, you've heard of the Iowa caucus debacle. Uh, the caucus is one way to do a primary, which is a highly undemocratic way of doing it, where people have to show up physically for hours inside yeah. typically like high school gymnasiums and do like uh, multiple rounds of voting for the candidate that they think would be best, ultimately ending up with one candidate that then gets the win in that, uh, in that yeah. district. Um, so you saw that in Iowa, where there were thousands of meetings going on at the same time and um i believe that the record high of participation in a caucus event was hovering at around 17 percent of the state's uh eligible population so it's mm. it's definitely one of the least democratic ways of uh of doing a primary and uh, the the event that we're seeing today is the most popular obviously i believe it's only iowa and nevada that still do the caucus um, that still do the caucus way of, of doing a primary, but this is a more typical election that we're seeing in New Hampshire today as we're recording this, where it's more a, a popular vote situation where yeah. um, like on election day, you just go and you hand in a ballot and then the person who gets the most votes wins the states. I, f I forget. I, it might be Nevada that also does a caucus. I know, I know one of them is open and one of them is closed. Yeah, I believe I believe that uh, Iowa is open and Nevada is closed. Yeah, or something like that. Because uh, I know that there was a Republican Party in some state that said that encouraged Republicans to go to an open caucus. I think it was in the South or, or on the West Coast or something. It might have been Nevada. 
uh, and and they encourage Republicans to go to an, to the Open Democratic Caucus and vote for Bernie Sanders because they believe that Bernie Sanders is like the least strong candidate and the one that Trump can beat the easiest, which was pretty hilarious because I think it's pretty much the opposite. Well, I mean, all polls, yeah, that is that is a um, like a popular opinion on the on the right too, where you're seeing people like Tucker Carlton go out and do a lot of um, direct to camera. Uh, apology stuff for Sanders but what we're seeing now and I think that's going to change what we're seeing is that polls are suggesting that Sanders is actually more popular among uh, independents than yeah. Trump himself or any other Democrat in the field so I think the, the ever crucial independents showing that they support Sanders more is going to change the tactic of the Republicans and the Democrats too I mean Bernie himself was independent for a very long time he still is. He's not. The, he's not a member oh, of the yeah, Democrats. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he technically is. Yeah, he's running for Democratic, Democratic nominee, but he's not technically. He's not a Democratic senator. He doesn't represent them in the Senate. Yeah, he aligns with the Democrats, but he's still an independent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the, I mean, the caucus is interesting because, essentially, what the entire process is for, for like people who already know who they're gonna vote for, they're not gonna budge. Like they're just go stand in whatever corner of their candidate. Is you know, um, you know, all the Bernie supporters are gonna vote for Bernie no matter what, but all the undecided voters, they're just there to be like peer pressured by people and like pulled in the arm and be like, "Come stand over here, come on, it'll be great, you just do it." And it's uh, it's like an elaborate game of musical chairs where people yeah, initially line up among the people that they came there thinking they would support, and then the people with the 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 candidates with the least amount of people that have shown up and stood in their corner are eliminated and those people can either choose to sit out like you said or they can line up behind some other candidate and mm. that's how someone like Buttigieg ended up doing so well was because a lot of people showed up supporting Biden or Klobuchar or some other centrist democrat and then saw that there was an opportunity to have a majority if you lined up behind uh, Mayor Pete or Pete yeah. Buttigieg, but yeah, he uh, Buttigieg is uh, not a very well liked candidate on a national scale. And I think what we're going to see now is, and if if you ask people over at uh, at the the um, the Meta Poll Institutes, he's not a very popular guy for very good reason among a, a big selection of the American public for his uh, past statements and acts as mayor of uh, of South Bend, Indiana. Yeah. So I'm actually, um, when you said that Buttigieg was not a very popular uh, candidate, I actually looked up um, the very latest polls. Um, for, from New Hampshire or nationally? For national, the national polls for the Democratic primaries. And mm -hmm. since yesterday, uh, so yesterday Joe Biden was polling uh, as as the most popular candidate, but today Bernie Sanders, for the first time ever, is actually the most popular candidate for the Democratic primaries, which is which is huge and is actually getting coverage. I saw those numbers too, and it's getting coverage on CNN and MSNBC, yeah. which means that they are you know it's it's getting to be such a big momentum behind Bernie at the moment, which I didn't anticipate. Yeah. That even the mainstream media has to, you know, debate it and take it seriously. Yeah. Because until now they've mostly ignored, like they did in 2016, Bernie's, uh, Bernie's run for president. Yeah. So, so Elizabeth Warren has been going down, essentially since, um, since November she's been going down, and her supporters seem to be going over to Bernie. Um, Joe Biden's supporters seem to be supporting uh, Michael Bloomberg, and to possibly to an extent, Mayor Pete. Uh, Andrew Yang and Amy Klobuchar are just stacking. I mean, they're not moving up or down. They're just down there at the bottom, falling at uh, 4 and 3%, respectively. And our candidate, mm -hmm. Tom Steyer, is pulling at a, a whopping 1.8%, which I think is incredible, and I think he has a good shot at, you know, making it from there, I think. You know, they often talk about, oh, who won the, the, you know, the election, who won the primary, who came yeah. in first, second, third, fourth. But you really have to look down, you know, down the line and the list <laughs> of candidates to find the true winners. You know, yeah. you can't just say, oh, the person that came in number one is the winner. You have yeah. to really 
study it and see, you know, who got, you know, single digit support, you know, among <laughs> all the different age ranges and, mm -hmm. and uh, ethnic groups to see who the real winner of the race is. So yeah. I, I'm very proud. And I think if anything, Steyer is beating all the expectations. He's showing his strength. He's showing his muscles. He's, he's, he's on the prowl, you know, he's, he's a good boy and he's here to make friends and have fun. <laughs> I think, I think that, I think that is why he's running is just to yeah. make friends. It seems, yeah. I mean, he's, he's coming across <laughs> as, as intensely malleable in all the debates like he's mm. he's simply there to say i agree with you guys like, <laughs> i i think you're making such excellent points and just just sparkling in his beautiful array of of ties and 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 friendly friendly body language he's 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 really the overlooked candidate of this race he's just the inoffensive fun boss okay by the way by the way can we just revel in how awesome it is that biden's campaign is crumbling right now Oh yeah, no, he's uh, he's been uh, doing attack ads on Pete Buttigieg actually instead of yeah, on I saw Bernie. It, it um, was yeah, that's that's an intent. That's probably the most negative ad of the campaign so far. Yeah, when they they so for those who haven't seen it, uh, it, there's an ad going, a uh, Joe Biden ad which compares Joe Biden to Pete Buttigieg and their like records and. Basically, what the entire ad boils down to is saying Joe Biden was the vice president, Pete Buttigieg was a mayor, and that's not as important. So vote Biden. And it's, it's so like, fun, too, because CNN, I think it was CNN or it was MSNBC, who confronted Biden afterwards saying, so uh, you said the same thing about Obama in 08, and Biden said, yeah, 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 but this is different. He's, he's nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he said the exact same thing about Obama in 2008. Obama was a nobody in 08. What the fuck was he? Yeah, I mean, he, uh... I, I, there's a distinction, I guess, because Obama was a senator, but, you know, and, yeah. and, and Pete is a, was a small town mayor. Um, like, I have a lot of, I've read up on Pete, and he's way shadier than, than people give him credit for. He's, mm. I, I, I legitimately think he's a CIA plant in this election. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking. After reading all the, ugh. And he's, I sound gonna, like a, a he's gonna pull theorist. A, a Joker and just fucking shoot Bernie live on stage. I think in one of these debates. I mean, I wouldn't put it past him at this point. Yeah. If he if he loses New Hampshire, he's gonna quit being the ask for the manager guy and start being the the the, the mass shooter that people <laughs> accuse Bernie of being. Um, so Pete is pulling at a ten point two percent. He's currently the fifth. Most popular candidate nationwide. Bloomberg is fourth, Warren is third, Biden is second, Bernie is first. As much as I hate the narrative that, oh, it's not going to be New Hampshire that decides the race, it's going to be Nevada, mm -hmm. I think there's something to it because that's the state that if Biden doesn't come in top two, his campaign is over. And yeah. if Pete Buttigieg's campaign does as poorly as it seems like he might, in Nevada, he also has to consider his options. So, because that's Nevada is one of the first states that's that truly kind of represents the diversity in America, where uh, Iowa is exceptionally white, New Hampshire is exceptionally East Coast, mm. but Nevada is kind of like the average. This is very offensive, of course, to say, but like uh, an average picture of the American population, I guess you could say. And um, I just saw now that um, Biden has, uh, has announced that he's not going to be celebrating the New Hampshire victory in New Hampshire. He's already left for South Carolina because mm. he realizes he's lost it. So yeah. uh, I just looked up the polls for New Hampshire and Biden is pulling at 9%. Yeah, he is. Like, yeah, I think, I think the race is going to be a lot closer than, than the polls are saying. And I think yeah. maybe like... It all it all depends on turnout, obviously. I think I tweeted something along those lines too. But I think I think it's really neck and neck between Buttigieg and Sanders for this one. I hope I'm wrong, and I hope that Sanders runs away with it. I mean, Steyer runs away with it. Yeah, um, that <laughs> he's pulling a three percent, by the way. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, Steyer is obviously going to win this one. Yeah, I think so. Um, but yeah, so in Iowa, obviously, we saw Bernie did win the popular vote. He won by like six thousand votes or something like that. 
um yeah so so Buttigieg obviously won yeah because so much like the electoral college uh in the presidential election some primaries use a system of assigning delegates not based on the votes but just on i i it's an arcane system that will make you crazy if you try to explain it or understand it. Just know that Bernie yeah. won and <laughs> it's it's stupid. It's really stupid. Like it yeah. has to do with how important your district is. It mm. has to do with how many people show up at your district. It has it's so dumb. It's yeah. completely nonsensical and in the end it doesn't matter. <laughs> It doesn't like matter. it's honestly like it, it. All it's done is it's given Buttigieg a chance to pro, uh, proclaim himself the the victor of the race without being challenged by it by the mainstream media, mm. and um, it's it's muddied the waters about who really won Iowa. But it was Bernie. Yeah, I saw um, uh, on the late night with Stephen Colbert. He interviewed Pete Buttigieg like a few days after the. Uh, oh, I saw that was infuriating. Yeah, and 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 he called him the first the first uh, gay person to ever win a presidential contest. I I I wasn't so so much frustrated with the gay part so much as the winning part, because yeah, the results weren't out when that when when Colbert made that interview. Like the results weren't in a hundred percent. And Buttigieg, like, proclaimed himself the victor without any votes being counted. Yeah. Which, which is just, like, the, the worst nerd chess club thing to do. Unless, like, he was, unless he was deliberately engaged in the cover-up that happened. It was the, the worst kind of uh, hubris, human hubris you could, expl- you, could, you could show in that situation. Yeah. There were also coin tosses, which I saw... Um... Which is just such a an insult to democracy because there were coin tosses in districts where Bernie had gotten more votes, but yes. it was still up to a coin toss, and the coin toss is still decided that uh, Buttigieg won. And and I saw this. There's this one video of a guy who who works at one of the one of the polling places, and he he tosses a coin, and he looks at it. And he sees what it is, and then he flips it over, and then he's like, yeah, it's a delicate repeat Buttigieg. Yeah. I mean, it's such a, like, there's never going to be a caucus in Iowa again. I must be the <laughs> fifth million per- millionth person on a podcast to say this by now, but they completely destroyed their own completely undemocratic system that has made them even semi-relevant for the, for all this time because they were first to to, to be in the nomination process but they completely destroyed it in a coordinated effort to to destroy bernie's momentum but they're not they're, it's not going to accomplish anything because people are people are going to just get more angry and more engaged from what the dnc and uh in iowa did and they're gonna they're gonna feel like it matters even more that they vote if they support bernie so it's gonna it's gonna drive more people to be aware of the process and feel like they have to actively counteract what the dnc is doing yeah it's hopeless for them like they're they're panicking so i've been reading up on mayor pete i'm sure other people like youtube is buzzing right now and all the podcasts are buzzing with mayor pete and it's it's a very real possibility that mayor pete will win in new hampshire tonight i honestly wouldn't be surprised because of the amount of undeclared voters so Mm -hmm. obviously as we're recording this, it might be a possibility that Mayor Pete wins New, Ham- uh, New Hampshire and gets a huge boost out of it. Yeah. But to anyone listening, I can't imagine anyone listening who would support Mayor Pete to this podcast, <laughs> honestly. But spread the word that Mayor Pete, he's entirely compromised and in the pocket of uh, not just the CIA, but also billionaires in America. He's mm. someone who's, who's lived uh, in and around CIA operations around the world. He's been to Somaliland at around the time when when people were pushing for them to be an independent nation because it would increase American military presence in Africa. He he is someone who has a very shady past. He obviously had a, a big hand in financing the app that was used in Iowa, which after being um after the results being pulled back and the poll from CNN being pulled, uh was something that um 
He was instrumental in developing and financing with the Shadow team, and most of the Shadow team, in fact, were people who worked with Buttigieg on his campaign earlier, and it was hastily developed in such a way that it could easily be man- that the results could easily be manipulated, and many people reported that the things that they reported to the app weren't being represented accurately, and a lot of Sanders votes were subtracted from Sanders and given to um, other candidates with smaller margins, such as uh, a Yang, to make the, the 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 race much closer than it was in actuality. So he like Buttigieg is a very shady guy, and he's he's honestly it's you should honestly question why Mayor Pete as this unbelievably nerdy nobody. <laughs> who just came out of left field as initially like this joke candidate now has all of the support behind him now has all of the talking heads talking him up and and why they've chosen him exactly it's because yeah. he is someone who's been supported by um the the CIA and the DNC for being someone who won't knock on the status quo for being someone who is capable of doing a credible uh, a Mickey Mouse version of Obama speeches, um, and and that that is Mayor Pete. He's someone that they can mold into doing whatever they want. Like as South Bend mayor, he he read the room and saw that people were obviously pushing for racist initiatives. So he just fired the two most prominent black uh, leaders in the community. He uh, cracked down harder on the black community as mayor than in the rest of the state of Illinois. Uh, and and like he's something. entirely that's saying something yeah mm. like higher than the state average and that was something that increased while he was mayor like before yeah. it wasn't higher than the state average so he's someone who's malleable enough to be pushed into the direction of doing whatever the establishment and the people with money want him to do so mm-hmm. he'll tell you whatever you want to hear but then as soon as he gets into power he's just going to do whatever the, the the largest donors tell him to do i think I, th- I think you can put it this way. If Tom Steyer is mm-hmm. the candidate who pays you to do stuff for him, then Buttigieg is the candidate where you pay him to do stuff for you. If you're a billionaire, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and Steyer is infinitely better because he doesn't have any friends, billionaires or not billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. He has lots of friends. He has you and I. We're his friends. That's true. That's tr- I really wish I could get out of that WhatsApp group with him because he just texts the weirdest gifs. He keeps re-adding us. He keeps re-adding us. That's the thing. We keep coming up with excuses. And, th- and then he says, oh, it looks like you accidentally left. Yeah. Every he, time. And, and you don't want to be a, a jerk. So you just say, oh, yeah, I guess I did. And then he just sends the same gifs over and over yeah. again. Of, yeah. People tripping. And you just go, yeah, Tom. Yeah. That's kind of funny. <laughs> Yeah, send selfies showing off his ties. Yeah, and and he keeps asking me about this jacket he wants to buy. Yeah, if it's if it's uh, awesome or not. <laughs> Do you think he asks if um, if he would think the jacket is awesome or radical? Yeah, and I don't know. I I don't know the difference. No, I'm not sure either. I said awesome. I think you said radical, and I think that confused him. Yeah, he he went. Uh, <laughs> He went dark for a few hours after that. I think he. I think that really messed with him. <laughs> I, like, I, yeah. I, I want to publicly say this. I before the Iowa caucus, I tweeted um, my support for Tom Steyer, and his son liked it on Twitter. <laughs> I just want to have that on public record. Yeah, yeah. I didn't believe you when you first said it, so I looked at your tweet and then I saw. That, oh yeah, there he is. That's Tom Steyer's son. <laughs> Shout out to Sam Steyer, you rule. Yeah. Um, it was yeah. like one of three people, too. It was so funny. <laughs> uh, Buttigieg is obviously not going to win the, the, the primaries. Like, he's not going to become the Democratic candidate. He's just, he's polling way too low. He's not rising nearly quickly enough to win more than a few states. But, What's important about defeating him in, in, in these early primaries um, is to get more momentum behind Bernie. Because if Bernie loses the, these first few primaries, like the first three, four primaries, he's going to lose momentum and people are going to look at other candidates. 
Um, and it's also very important to, to make sure that Biden loses just by as wide a margin as possible. Just like bury him down there with Tom Steyer. Honestly, yeah. The, the number one priority that any American should have right now is burying Biden. Yeah. Like just six feet down in the ground. Just get him <laughs> out of the picture. Don't actually. I'm not. I, we're not advocating murder. We're saying, M- yeah, bury him in the polls. Figuratively, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Figuratively, make sure you bury him so deep he can't come up again. Yeah. He he is like if you remember the the episode we did long ago on Shit Island where we talked about the candidates. I went on a long tirade of his record, and obviously I'm no fan of his, but. You don't need to do more than a Google search and read a few lines of what he's done and said just in the last week to know yeah. what a reprehensible human being Joe Biden is. It seems like yeah. every time he opens his mouth, he says something either homophobic, racist, misogynistic, or demeaning to young people or minorities or... Yeah, no, he, he's, he's just the worst guy. The people who, who vote for him must have gotten the you know, the mass media brain bug that just tells people that anyone, like anyone electable you can run against Trump is worth it Uh, because there's just absolutely no person, you know, maybe below the age of 72 that would look at Joe Biden and say, he's a progressive voice in the world today. Speaking of the mass media, I saw, so after the, the caucus results, were in and then Buttigieg declared victory. Uh, some, you know, Biden supporters start start calling him a rat um, and insulting him on on Twitter essentially. And CNN went out and said that, you know, basically the same thing they said before when when the same thing happened with Warren that Bernie Bros are bullies online and like whenever. Any candidate is criticized by Bernie Sanders supporters. They're branded as bullies because they're uncivil and they can't cooperate or whatever, which is so yeah. tiring to hear. It's yeah, it's it's incredible to see how coordinated the media is in these attacks on candidates. And I think that the Sanders campaign actually handled it extremely well by saying that this is something that the mass media and centrist Democrats have done for a long time. And in 2008, the Hillary campaign launched a similar campaign against the Obama campaign by saying that there was such a thing as Obama bros who would go (laughs) online and troll Hillary. So this is not a new thing. This is the media freaking out about how popular Bernie is. And they don't have any arguments, so they default to the argument that you're mean. (laughs) Yeah. Which is just the lamest thing. Like, just address it like instead of saying sanders supporters are mean to pete online say why are they you know all of them throwing this emoji at pete like what is the motivation for doing this Mm. that's the interesting question for any journalist looking at it it should be what happened right now to make everyone tweet rats at pete Buttigieg? oh it has something to do with an app and him financing it interesting let's report on that but that's not the takeaway. The the takeaway is Sanders supporters are mean. Yeah. Speaking of uh, supporters of candidates, um, Andrew Yang supporters are still active on Twitter, which really surprises me. Yeah, we got into a bit of a thing with a Yang supporter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, they are... I mean, they're passionate. Uh, they're a bit delusional, I think. I mean, yeah. Yang is pulling at 3%. Nationwide is pulling at five percent in New Hampshire. Like I, I genuinely think Tom Steyer has a better chance of winning the presidency than Andrew Yang does at this point. But yeah, I, I just, I don't, I've, I've never, so, so, I've, I've never considered spending much time reading up on Yang's stance on the issues because mm. he's such a non-starter as a candidate. Yeah. Because of his the the whole approach to it is basically we need more capitalism to fix capitalism, <laughs> which where yeah. I just go like okay run as a Republican like yeah. you're you're not you're officially not a progressive choice in this election you're not going to convince old people because you're a, a a Silicon Valley entrepreneur which they just see as oh so you're the one building the robots that are replacing me 
Mm. And to it's basically like math nerd bros, essentially. <laughs> I think <laughs> the people that are mm. like, hey, we we need new technology. This guy is technology. <laughs> This guy like totally worked at Silicon Valley, so yeah. he's he's technology, bro. He he knows math. Like the, the the Yang campaign literally has a sticker that just says math. I didn't I did not know that. That is this is this is a true yeah. fact. Uh, yeah, Andrew Andrew Yang said that no matter what happened, he was never gonna pull out of the race. Like until the last primary, he's not gonna he's not gonna drop out. Well, you know, one thing I admire about Yang, and it's always Yang we get the most negative comments about. Yeah, I don't understand why there are people who listen to this show and still support Yang. <laughs> I think a lot of Yang supporters have a lot of free time, which is not necessarily a diss, <laughs> because most Bernie supporters also seem to spend a lot of time online, so mm. hey Yang gang. Um, the thing I do respect about Yang is that he he is someone who has like an actual an actual coherent message, right? Mm. Like he's not like Buttigieg who's just in it to become president. He's someone who realizes that this is probably not going to be a campaign he wins, but he has these suggestions and these ideas that he would implement if he was president. Yeah. So that's a that's a point for him. Like the UBI thing, valid discussion. Um, but you know, ultimately he's in it to upset the status quo, which is admirable in a sense. I, I've gotten the question a few times. I don't know if they're Yang supporters or if they're just curious, but I've gotten the question a few times what I think of UBI. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, it, it, it's a complicated system. It hasn't been tested a whole bunch to see does it lead to inflation, does it lead to higher prices and that kind of thing. Didn't they I, try it somewhere in Switzerland? They've tried it on, on smaller scales. In, in smaller communities, but not on such a lar like, like a large scale like the entirety of the United States of America. Mm. Like, that's never really been done before. Um, and I also think that UBI, to a certain degree, is a bit of a... It's like, it's like a band-aid on a flesh wound. Yeah. Like, it, it certainly a universal basic income, and, and depending on what it is, if it's $500, $1,000, or $2,000 a month... Uh, can certainly be a big help to a lot of people who are in poverty, people who don't have jobs or are very low-paying jobs. But I think the main issue is the fact that there still are people living in poverty who don't have jobs or have very low-paying jobs. The fact that people in America can't afford health care or have student debt or can't afford to have their cars repaired or can't like literally cannot not have a car because they need a car to get to work and there's no public transport. And like, like there are systematic issues at the root, which Andrew Yang, first of all, is not addressing. And second of all, he actually wants to take away uh, spending on stuff like Medicare and Medicaid and, and, and healthcare and, and education. And like, he wants to take away spending on welfare. Like he wants to cut basically every, all kinds of public spending and 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 then introduce UBI as like a catch-all, um, which which he, you know he proposes is going to solve all the issues. But he's ultimately the American government under Yang would be spending less money. Like it would you know it would introduce essentially austerity measures, um, and then trying to compensate a little bit with UBI. But ultimately, I think the American people, especially those who are most marginalized, who are most affected by like the cost of healthcare and that kind of thing, they're going to have less money, not more. Yeah, and that's that's what I meant too by saying he's not a progressive voice. Yeah, like he he's he's not. He he really isn't. He come he has a lot of of like he's basically trying to bribe people into voting for him <laughs> in a sense with this UBI thing because yeah. it's not working very well. <laughs> Yeah, and like he's basically promising people money and still losing. That's how yeah. shitty of a th of a of a system he's proposing. He's yeah. he's he's saying let's make the system much worse and much better mm. for billionaires. But you get a thousand dollars a month. Yeah. So, so UBI has UBI has one upside is that it cuts through all the red tape. It cuts through all the unforeseen loopholes in the law. Right. With welfare, like with welfare checks, unemployment checks, there are rules and regulations. There are criteria you have to meet in order for you to get 
that check in the mail. If you're oh, not sure. looking yeah. for a job, you don't get unemployment checks. If you have turned down a job, even if it was a terrible job, if, if you turn down any job at all, you don't get unemployment checks and that kind of thing. UBI, even if you are a billionaire, you still get that check in the mail. Every single citizen gets the, the, the check. And so to that extent, I, I can see an argument for UBI is that it will ensure, it will create this uh, floor for everyone to stand on, right? This universal basic income, right? It's universal. It's for absolutely everyone and there are no exceptions. It's basic. It's a floor to stand on. It's not a much. It doesn't make you rich, but it's enough for you to not be in poverty. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's a, a soft endorsement thing of it. But to me, that argument is even better for something like universal health care. Yes. Because, or just generally <laughs> universalizing, meaning everyone gets access to public services. Because yeah. if, if the billionaire or the influential person, if you don't have billionaires, the, the person who has access to the state apparatus, if they enjoy a thing that everyone else also is getting, they're not going to spend a lot of money or time to get rid of it again. And mm. that's what happens when you, when you introduce things only targeted at certain people is other people are going to feel bad that they're paying for it. Mm. So in that sense, yeah, the UBI, it does have that element of it where you go, everyone's going to get the money. So people maybe aren't going to complain as much uh, about it. And mm. uh, it's going to create this floor of, of economic sustainability. But that's, again, on a very shallow level. It doesn't yeah. address the, the very systemic, especially in America, the very systemic inequality problems that disproportionately affect working class people and minorities. Uh, there was an experiment in, in China, and uh, I believe it was in uh, Guangzhou or Sichuan or Yunnan, a, a southern province in China. I mean, China is obviously a huge country with many, many people, but they are working really fast to try to industrialize the country and bring people out of poverty. And they've been doing a good job of bringing people out of poverty. Like, they've been doing it really, really quickly at, like, an unprecedented level. Fastest, fastest rise in, um, rise out of um, starvation and poverty in human history. Yeah. But, so, in, in one of these areas which was still fairly poor, which hadn't been industrialized yet, they had a trial run. Uh, I believe they, they still have it, actually, of um, a universal basic income. So it's not on a national level, it's on a provincial level, right? It goes to all the citizens who live in a certain area. I forget I forget if it was a whole province or just a, a few towns or whatever, but it, it was an area in China anyway. And, and they received universal basic income and they saw positive results from it. And they saw people getting out of poverty, people being able to get jobs, get cars, uh, and all that kind of thing. But the caveat to that, I think, is they still had universal health care and they still had free education up to your university level. Yeah, the conditions are fundamentally different. Yeah. If we get to the point where, like, where, there, where there are jobs for everyone, where there's health care for everyone, where there's education for everyone, where everyone has a, an apartment to live in and food to put on their table, if we get to that point, Right through the normal means of ensuring welfare and ensuring you know universal public services, if we get to that point and we still feel like, man, people are in poverty and they're really poor, and we really need more money going around the economy right now, then we can introduce universal basic income. That's my stance on it. Yeah, it's to, again like it. It makes for an interesting debate. I'll give Yang that. It makes for an interesting <laughs> yeah, debate. Yeah, no, it does. But all of the surrounding proposals he's made are awful. Like all of the, the things that he proposes alongside it, or most of, like he's said some single issue things that is basically just parroting Bernie or Warren. Mm. But the, the fundamental material things that go alongside his proposal for UBI have all included cutting services, cutting government, Mm. And that's just, that's not a good idea in, these, in the state that the American society is in. Yeah. I mean, just, just looking at it, Yang being essentially a conservative, but supporting something new and interesting and which sounds really progressive, like 
UBI. I would say is a pretty genius strategy if he had been able to pull it off a bit better. Because he is essentially masquerading as a progressive. Like, he, he, he is a, a conservative, almost like, like he's a fiscal conservative hiding behind progressive clothing. He, yeah, he, he really is the Silicon Valley liberal candidate. The yeah. ultra the ultra libertarian, economically, uh, social liberal type person, who I remember I remember in the in the at around the time that Obama was elected, a lot of celebrities in Hollywood and and high profile people were coming out saying that they were fiscally conservative, socially <laughs> liberal, like yeah. before the current trend of uh, Me Too and more focus on wealth inequality mm -hmm. it was very socially acceptable to just say like i like the republicans on economics and i like the democrats on their gay policy that made you a woke person in 2008 yeah. and he seems like he's taken out of that crowd entirely and i think that is a very silicon valley thing to do you see like tim cook of apple and donald trump made a an ad together about mm -hmm. how trump was bringing jobs back to america and trump was walking around the the American Apple core buildings. But then at the same time, you see Tim Cook tweeting about how LGBT plus communities uh, need to be respected and so on and so forth. Like that is to me, that just encapsulates the Silicon Valley thing. It's just like you want to signal virtue things that young people like on social issues, but you also want the, the incredibly generous tax cuts for the billion dollar industry that the Republicans can give you. Hmm. I honestly don't want to give Yang too much credit. Like he's <laughs> he's no. polling like at what one percent, two percent state like nationwide. He's been in this forever. He he's not going to go anywhere. I feel way no. more threatened by someone like Buttigieg than mm. um, Yang as someone who's a staunch Steyer supporter. Obviously, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I feel like Buttigieg is really stealing Steyer's thunder. <laughs> Steyer should come out in support of UBI, I think. But he's, he's going to give everyone $2,000 a month. And he's, yeah. he's not going to tax people. He's going to give it out of his own pocket. <laughs> <laughs> See, that would be a game changer. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he needs to do. Yeah, I think so. We should, we should tell him that in the WhatsApp group that we're in with him. Yeah, we should tell him. Well, you can Will tweet at him? his son. Yeah, I can tweet at his son. <laughs> Tell your dad to get back on WhatsApp. <laughs> he could, like, uh, uh, Steyer could accuse uh, uh, Bloomberg of being a lazy billionaire for not volunteering money out of his own pocket to every American. <laughs> yeah, that would I mean, be Bloomberg is sixth richest man in the world. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's basically, he's, what, paid $300 million in ads so far, and that's still yeah. just only, like, the interest rate of, like, the, the money he's getting from the bank. Uh, yeah. a year so he's incredibly rich and like i think he's gonna be the establishment guy soon and i think yeah, he might think be so. by the time this episode is out yeah I th I, he's he's surging in the polls like as as biden is, is falling he's surging there's a great observation by an snl sketch for once uh about how <laughs> um like bloomberg is a jewish guy from new york who owns his own media corporation like how easy is it gonna be for uh, like the MAGA crowd to to attach a conspiracy theory on that guy. Yeah, it would be the most embarrassing candidate. Would be billionaire Bloomberg. It would be funny to see Trump attacking Bloomberg for being a billionaire. <laughs> yes, it, it would be really funny to see if Trump would be offended that he's richer than him. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, Trump would crush him. Yeah, I mean Trump. It's so hard to predict Trump what he's going to do or how he's going to behave or what he's going to say. But I think it's a fair, I think it's fair to say that he would, he would win against most democratic candidates right now. I think maybe, I think Ber Bernie would have a chance against Trump. I think maybe even Yang would have a chance against Trump. The thing is like, you have two things going on in America right now. There's the establishment crowd and the anti-establishment crowd. Yeah. And the only p person I see being able to compete honestly 
one to one with Trump is Sanders and Steyer, mm-hmm. obviously, but Sanders primarily mm-hmm. because he represents the same anti-establishment sympathies that uh, Trump does. So it yeah. would be two anti-establishment guys uh, fighting it out, and it really doesn't matter that it's Sanders. It matters that they both dislike the current political climate in Washington. Yeah. If you put Trump up against an establishment character like they did in 16, Trump is going to win re-election. It's just that simple. And Buttigieg is an establishment guy. So is Bloomberg. So is Biden. So is Klobuchar. Like the field is full of people who believe that if you just do the Hillary thing, you're going to win against Trump. But that's, that's just proving to not be true. Like there hasn't been this groundswell of people saying enough is enough. We need to go back to politics the way it was. People are saying, we want change from Trump. We don't want to go back. We want something new. And we don't like the establishment, by the way. Did you see Trump went up 10% in his approval poll after he was acquitted? I did see that, yeah. And I, I've been saying it for so long. The yeah. impeachment <laughs> process was a giant mistake. Yeah, I thought of you when I saw that. Yeah, it's like, again, it's just playing into this thing of if you get someone to be, if you acquit someone, the vast majority of people are going to read that as he didn't do it. Yeah. Like, that's just, it's so unbelievably, like, the whole thing is preposterous, but taking it to the Senate was literally like volunteering to score an own goal because you yeah. know you're not going to win that vote. You need, like, uh, you need two thirds of the Senate to vote for it. Like, what, what did she think was going to come out of it? That the Democrats were going to look great? I honestly don't understand the line of thinking. I assume it was something like, even if they didn't, when people would, are going to read between the lines of something i don't know it would like expose trump as a fraud and that uh, the republicans as partisan and something like that uh, i guess it's a very naive establishment look <laughs> at the whole thing like it's a very it's like it's a very old fashioned way of looking at politics because i mean trump changed politics in america entirely yeah. Like you, you, it's unbelievable how big of a groundswell that happened around Trump and that's still happening all the time. He's changed the Republican Party fundamentally. People don't believe that Bernie can do the same thing for the Democrats, but he's already doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Bernie is, is since 2016, he's been changing Democratic politics. Yeah. I'm just, just look at the candidates in the Democratic uh, primary right now. They're saying things that were unthinkable eight years ago and even four years ago like talking about no stuff. one in, in in the democratic race would be supporting medicare for all if not if bernie didn't do it in 2016. no and that's just the beginning like honestly this race showing that you know bernie has a real shot despite literally saying i'm a democratic socialist is going to influence people in the future to replicate his ideas if he wins yeah. or not and that's a great win i think so uh, do you want to move on from America? Yes. We uh, the the fi- final thing, there was actually a funny connection I noticed. You know how Nancy Pelosi ripped up uh, Trump's speech? Yeah. In, uh, during the State of the Union, she did a symbolic thing where she ripped up his speech. It reminded me of a thing in Danish politics, which is now regarded as the biggest blunder of all time politically <laughs> in Denmark, which was in 2001, the Social Democratic Prime Minister ripped up the manifesto of his oppo- opposing... Um, political party in a gesture that was supposed to say Denmark will never do this and he <laughs> lost so you know it was it was like dubbed the biggest blunder in Danish politics because he completely misread the uh, opinion of the the Danish people and assumed everyone was on his team when in reality all it did was just show everyone that he is this authority moral authority over everyone who's Danish mm. um which people don't like being told what to think generally so it's it that that is attributed as one of the main reasons why the social democrats lost their power grab and uh for the first time since the 1920s ceased being the biggest party in denmark like it fundamentally changed that and some other things but primarily that uh (laughs) changed danish politics forever and moved the political uh, spectrum to the right in Denmark was just this arrogance that came with assuming that you could make this statement and people would be behind you when in reality you don't have the moral high ground to do what you're doing. Like Nancy Pelosi voted for um, increased military spending, voted for all these yeah. proposals that Trump did, and then 
as a symbolic moral high ground gesture ripped up the speech. It's completely preposterous. <laughs> and it was the same in Denmark. Speaking of Denmark, uh, is there anything in Danish politics going on at the moment? Anything worth talking about? Um, I mean, things are pretty good in Denmark right now. I have to say, uh, the social democratic um, government has introduced earmarked um, paternity leave for the first time mm-hmm. in Danish history. Um, yeah, Finland did big... uh, Finland did the same thing. They guaranteed uh, equal paternity. What, what's it called? Like equal parental leave for for fathers. Right. Yeah, it's far from equal in Denmark now, but it's the first time that um, men have been earmarked for specific days, meaning yeah. that it's going gonna, it's gonna to start the process of equalizing it, essentially. Yeah. Um, the thing that uh, happened in Denmark after the election was that the Social Democrats decided to form a minority government of just the Social Democrats, mm. which a lot of um, political commentators thought would mean it would be a very weak government because you need 90 mandates. They only had 40-something so they would have to keep reaching out to other parties for each, uh, for each little thing they wanted to get passed. But in reality, it's meant that they can kind of look away from the social liberals and go to the, um, the, the parties that are willing to do more socially conscious, uh, progressive mm. legislation, which has been good so far. I mean, it might completely fall apart by the time they have to pass a budget. But so far, they've done some um, some pretty progressive things. Obviously, it's not perfect. They haven't, and they don't intend to reverse any of the immigration policies that were enacted by the previous government. But on social issues, they seem to have done a lot so far. Like they've done, they've really pushed things in a in the a, a more um, progressive direction. I think. Yeah, Sweden's uh, social democrats are going in the opposite direction. So. <laughs> yeah, they're in a coalition government with the social liberals, right? They're, well, the quote-unquote social liberals. Uh, the Social Democratic Party is in a coalition with the Green Party, which is like... Very right-wing cent- economically, yeah, right? Yeah, center-right. Um, the, the Green Party is actually collaborating or, or in a coalition with the moderate, the conservative party in Stockholm instead of with the Social Democrats. So why the Social Democrats are still working with the Greens, I don't know. Um, but they're also in a coalition with the Centre Party and the Liberal Party. Both the both the Centre Party and the Liberal Party are uh, American like American style libertarian parties. I mean, they're very very fiscally libertarian. Right. Um, yeah. The main difference between them is the Centre Party is decentralist, and the Liberal Party is centralist. So the Liberal okay. Party wants a wants like a strong central state. But economically, everything should be privatized. Mm. And the, the center party is essentially like everything should be run by local communities and everything should be private. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously on the outside, but the things that get reported from Sweden all seem to suggest that the whole like there's a, a giant tide wave of reactionary politics headed towards Sweden. Like the, so the Sweden Democrats seem to be in a position where if there was an election right now, they would do exceptionally well. Yeah, for a very brief period of time, the Sweden Democrats were polling above the Social Democrats. If the Sweden Democrats were to win the next election, it will be the first time since 1921 that the Social Democratic Party is not the biggest party in the country. And that would be huge, obviously. Yeah, It, it would be, I mean, it would be history. But the Social Democrats are polling as the biggest party again now. They recovered. Uh, well, the, the, well, specifically, the, the Sweden Democrats, um, they tripped a bit. They went down a bit. Mm. But they are, I mean, they are neck and neck. So, I don't know exactly when this episode is going to drop, but it's definitely going to drop within the primary season in, in the the US. And I've kind of found myself becoming this thing that I didn't want to be, which is like someone who watches the American news all the time, someone who tweets about politics and someone who engages in this rapid uh, shitstorm, like continuing shitstorm of American politics, which is completely meaningless. And like, it's completely out of my control anyway, as someone who doesn't even live in the US and being like um, a, a philosophy dude myself i kind of question like why have i turned into this person that i didn't want to be and why am i suddenly so fervently 
engaged in what's going on in America and American politics again, when I'd kind of said, I, I don't really want to think about it until the actual election. Like what has made me now someone who's really into it? And I've come to the conclusion that it's absolute rage that's keep that's like making me engage in American politics. I am I'm so disgusted with the Democratic establishment and with the Republican establishment and the way that they run things uh, in shady ways and corrupt ways and in ways that consequently and um, arrogantly favors the very wealthy and manipulates and suppresses the votes of the people who are the most vulnerable in American society um, and consequently exports their neoliberal policies on the rest of the world to make sure that their financial interests in the billionaire class in the U.S. aligns with the trading conditions of Europe and Asia and Africa and other places. And that's, to me, something that absolutely Americans have a chance to change right now and something that Americans can now voice their dissent with. Like, Americans can now finally rally behind someone who is saying no to austerity, no to handing out billions of dollars to fossil fuel companies, to people who already have millions and billions of dollars on their bank accounts, to big corporations that treat them like shit and don't value their workers. And that to me is something that I think everyone in America should be aware that they now have a chance to come together in voicing the thing that, they, that has been oppressing them for so long is not what they want and not the direction that they want the world or America to move in in the future. They want to address climate change. They want to address um, workers' conditions. They want to address the way that the national political conversation is being done. And that, to me, is, is something that's worth getting the message out about. It's not about Bernie Sanders. It's not about Tom Steyer. It's not about anyone in particular. It's about a movement of people that want to change society radically. And that, to me, is, is worth fighting for. Even if Bernie doesn't win, it's worth to keep fighting and keep in contact and proximity with the people that agree with you because never again should Americans feel like they're crazy for thinking that the way that America and consequently the world is being run is unfair, unjust, and uh, inherently favoring only a handful of people on the behest of everyone else. So that's, that's my thought. So I think you should absolutely volunteer for Tom Steyer to be president of the United <laughs> States and, and do your part in making sure that uh, someone like Biden or Bloomberg never gets to be president ever again. Yeah. That's my uh, state of the union, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so please follow Tom Steyer on Twitter. Yes. Um, donate to his campaign and volunteer for him. Yeah. So yeah, vote Tom Steyer. I think that's, I think that's what we want to say this episode. Yes. Steyer for Prez. <laughs> what was the slogan again? Something like make everyone work. No, what's it? What's the slogan? <laughs> make everyone work. <laughs> make everyone my friend. What's the slogan? I just tweeted it as a joke. I mean, for reals. Um, um, slogan. It's uh, actions speak louder than words. Yeah, let's say it together. Actions speak, speak louder, louder than words. Twenty twenty. <laughs> <laughs> that's it <laughs> all right uh thank you to our lovely patrons thank you joshua cheeseman dunk junk funk oc sabo kitty roland balant m lim nian chan min will m alfie bridge smith l aim emil segebeck kva graham john h n and jedi davian you are all great, and we love you. You keep us uh, existing. Keep us, keep us alive. Keep us not homeless. <laughs> you and Tom Steyer. <laughs> yeah. We have this episode alone, I think we're going to get like $100,000 from Tom Steyer. At least. I heard he's going to send us the best ties. <laughs> <laughs> he pays us exclusively on ties. <laughs> <laughs> Please be tartan ones. Please be tartan ones. <laughs> they're all the same yeah. one that he always wears the red one <laughs> and they're all like discount ties from Costco 
<laughs> do you think do you think Tom Starr buys discount Tyson No. Going? You think no, I don't no. think so. I think that's one of the few things in life he splurges on is his tie selection. His I think his tie is worth at least ten million dollars. Easily. Easily. Yeah, it's probably knitted from this <laughs> the the fur of the cats that poop out the coffee rich people drink. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, we'll see you in the next episode. And uh, 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 